morning, everyone. Today we are going to be talking about z-scores. Uh, we are now in week seven of our semester. Our semester has flown by, to be honest. Uh, at this point, I'm thinking to myself, wow, we're almost halfway done with the semester. Um, everything seems to have kind of been a, a blur up to this point, to be honest with you. Um, I'm having a great time teaching this class. I hope everyone is having a really good time um, in the class. I know that we've kind of had some ups and downs in terms of the start of the semester with uh, some technical glitches that we had, and then we've kind of uh, smoothed all those issues out, but now we're really getting into the nitty-gritty stuff about statistics, and I know that it almost feels a little bit too overwhelming in some instances whenever it is that we get too in-depth with some formulas uh, as we did with standard deviation. Um, so this week, you know, even though we will be talking about a formula and we are going to be talking about a new statistic, um, it's odd to talk about z-scores, to be honest, because when you think about z-scores, you really don't think about the use of z-scores in a practical sense. It is very difficult to think about when it is to use z-scores and in the real world when we would actually want to use z-scores. And I'm going to try my best to kind of give you different examples of when we would want to use z-scores in the real world. Um, those instances are going to be very far and in between, but they do exist. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I do want to show you the importance of trying to calculate a z-score. And I know I just said a very taboo word in our class, right? The term calculate. Um, I know that we are going to do some calculations. The formula for z is going to look very simple at its initial state. So you're going to be like, oh, it's only three parts. But then when you really look at the formula itself, you're going to be like, those three parts are a little bit complicated to calculate. Now, granted, they're all things that we have already calculated this semester in terms of our class. So in reality, z-score is nothing different than what we've already been doing this semester. All that we're now doing is taking other statistics that we've already calculated in the past, such as our average, uh, knowing what our score is, and also standard deviation. I know you hate that word, but there it is again, right? So we have that term standard deviation. And now we're going to be using all those three points, so my x, my average, and also my standard deviation to now calculate this new value of z. Now, when we think about z-scores and we're wanting to think about what a z-score is, I guess that's the biggest overarching question. So what is a z-score? You've probably never really heard of a z-score. You've probably never been in a situation where somebody would bring up in a conversation a z-score. Uh, you know, you've probably been in a conversation where somebody talks about the median or the mean or something along those lines. Uh, but very rarely somebody's going to talk about a z-score in just a general, you know, kind of discussion. So what is a z-score? A z-score is actually what we call a standard score. Uh, why is it called a standard score? It's a standard score because we essentially are standardizing now everyone's score. So we're making everyone's score equal in terms of standard deviation and in terms of the average. So in other words, to calculate someone's z-score, we're going to have to know what their average is, and we're also going to need to know what their standard deviations are for that specific distribution. So here, I'm using this term distribution, so what am I talking about? Remember that with distributions, we're essentially talking, for instance, about like our frequency distributions. So in our particular case, when we think about our z-score, our z-score is going to be on a distribution that looks like this. This is what we're going to also call a standardized normal distribution in our particular case. Uh, standardized distributions are always normal. Uh, they're always unimodal. They're symmetrical. They're not skewed. Um, and they're not kurtonic. So here it satisfies all our criterias associated with normality in this particular case. So what we're wanting to do is we want to now put everyone's score on this distribution and try to find the location of a particular person's score in relative distance to the mean. So in other words, our mean is going to be right here because if you remember on a normal distribution, my mean, median, and mode all land at the highest point right here of this distribution. So it lands right smack in the middle of this distribution. So in this particular case, this would be my average for that distribution. So now what I want to know is, let's say for instance, Susie, uh, and Susie performs um, at, at a 75. Okay, she gets a score of a 75 on the exam. What I want to know now is where does Susie land on this distribution in relative distance to the mean, but now the weird thing about a z-score 
is that the value of a z-score is going to be based on a standard deviation. So in other words, z-score is going to tell me how far each one of my scores is from the mean in terms of standard deviations. I know that sounds like a really weird thing, and I'm going to say it one more time. So what a z-score is going to tell me, it's going to tell me how far every single score is, or an individual score is, from the mean in terms of standard deviations. So in other words, let's say for instance I have five scores. So my first score is a 75. My second score, one, two, let me make sure I get that. Second score is equal to an 80. My third score equal to an 81. Fourth score equal to a 60. And my fifth score equal to a 90. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate a z-score for that value there, a z-score for value number 2, for 3, for 4, and also for 5. So in other words, every single participant has a score that they got on the exam. Now they're also going to have a z-score associated with their exam. Why would I want to know the z-score? The z-score is essentially, again, going to tell me how far my particular score is from the mean based on the number of standard deviations. So remember that we calculate a standard deviation, right, for a particular data set, right? So we're, let's say, for instance, we calculate the standard deviation for here and whatever my standard deviation is equal to. So what we're now going to try to find out is we're going to try to find out 75. How far from the mean is a value of a 75 in terms of number of standard deviations? So that seems like a very odd thing. But it's going to make intuitive sense to us once it is that we can continue to go through the entire uh, lecture today. But always keep that in mind. A z-score is, is a standardized score because this distribution is standardized because of the mean and standard deviation that we're working with. Okay, so it's based on that aspect. And essentially, it's going to give me a way to know people's performance in terms of the standard deviation, or sorry, people's performance in terms of the mean based on the number of standard deviations. So in other words, when we calculated the average for the group, right? So when we calculated the, the, the group mean, we said that the group mean, let's say for instance, was an 80. But we didn't know your score. So we said for everyone in the class, the average was an 80. But then how did that person perform? How did you perform? Well, I don't know that because if I only look at the average, it's taking everyone's score into consideration, not just your own particular score. So here, you get lost. When I calculate a standard deviation, the same thing happened. How far from the mean were you? I don't know that answer. Because again, standard deviation was also an average, and it was telling me how far, on average, everyone's score in the data set was away from the mean. Right? Now with the z-score, I'm going to know exactly your distance from the mean in terms of number of standard deviations. So now we're going back to the individual. So rather than just assessing the group's performance, we're now going back to assess the individual's performance, which is ideal for me. Because now what I can do is I can literally talk about you. So if this is Susie right here. This is partic participant Susie. There we go. I can now say Susie performed in comparison to the mean at this level. So she was above the mean or below the mean, and I know the exact distance from the mean in terms of standard deviations. And that's going to be very useful information for me. So what is this idea of a standard score? A standard score is essentially a raw score that has been adjusted for the mean and the standard deviation for the distribution from which that raw score comes from. I know that sounds like a mouthful and it sounds very weird and odd to say that, but let's just break down that sentence. So what does it mean to have a raw score that is adjusted for the mean and standard deviation of the distribution for which the raw score comes from? So in other words, let's say that here are our five participants, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate an average for these five participants. So we calculate the average for this group. And in our particular case, if you have your calculators, you can follow along with me. Just so that way you guys can also check my math, right? So 75 plus 80 plus 81 
plus 60 plus 90 should give me a sum of x of 386. And I'll go ahead and confirm that, and that is correct. We're going to divide, in this particular case, by five values. So my average is a 77 point, whoops, there we go, 77.2. So in other words, for this group of participants here, their average for their distribution was a 77.2, okay? Now, we're also going to need to know what the standard deviation is for this particular group that we're working with. So here, we're going to go through that lengthy process of calculating standard deviation. So we're going to take each score minus the mean, we're going to then square those deviations, we're going to sum up those deviations, and then we're going to divide, in our particular case, by n minus 1 if we're working with the sample. Okay? If we're not working with the sample, if we're working with the population, then you're going to divide by capital N only. You're not going to divide by n minus 1, our degrees of freedom. So remember, we've been talking about this, this distinction between the population and also the sample. So if we're talking about calculating a sample z-score. In that particular case, when you calculate standard deviation, you're going to need to divide by n minus 1, our degrees of freedom. But if you're talking about the population z-score, in that particular case, when you calculate standard deviation, you need to divide by capital N only, because we're talking about the population standard deviation in that particular case. So be very, very weary of that. Um, as we're going along through this process, and, and I'll continue to, to make notes of this. And as if you noticed here, I'm keeping these consistent. So in other words, I'm talking about statistics here. I'm not talking about population parameters. So here I'm talking about my sample in this particular case. So in other words, we know that these five values here give me a specific average. They're going to have a specific standard deviation as well. So essentially what we have now are going to do is we're going to take each individual raw score and we're now going to adjust for the mean and standard deviation of that distribution to see how far my one individual score is from the mean in terms of standard deviations. That's what I want to do. So in other words, this distribution right here, if we're talking about these five scores, the average is going to be equal to 77.2 in our particular case. Okay, And the reason it's going to be equal to 77.2 is because that's the distribution that we're working with in this particular case. Now let's say, for instance, we were to have a different five values, and the average for that distribution was an 80.1. Then the average then becomes an 80.1 in that particular case. All right. So each distribution that we're going to be working with is essentially going to have a different mean and a different standard deviation because the scores are going to affect that mean and that standard deviation, just as we've been talking about this semester. So essentially, what is a standard score going to tell us? It's going to tell us how far your one particular score is from the mean in terms of standard deviations. And that's what a z-score is actually going to tell you. So the definition of a z-score are both of these definitions. A z-score is a raw score that is adjusted for the mean and standard deviation of the distribution from which the raw score comes from, thus to become a standard score, because that's what a z-score is. But a z-score in reality is going to tell you how far is your particular score from the mean in terms of standard deviation. Now here, why did we select to use the mean again as that point of reference? Remember that our mean has a great advantage. What's the great advantage associated with our mean? That the mean is one of the most stable statistics, in our particular case measure of central tendency, that is going to be stable from sample to sample that comes from the same population. So in other words, if, for instance, we have 30 people in the class and I randomly sampled five individuals, now those five individuals represent that population, but if I go in and I randomly select another five individuals in my population that are different from these five, the mean should be relatively similar if the same five individuals both come from um, the same population. So if both samples come from the same population, then the averages should be relatively similar to each other. They shouldn't be drastically different. So here, that's why we continue to use the mean, because it's the most stable estimate of the group's performance from sample to sample when they come from the same population. That's a very important issue. That's why we don't use the median or the, or the mode, because those fluctuate too frequently when we go from sample to sample.
but the mean remains pretty consistent because it takes everyone's score into consideration. So again, our z-score is essentially going to tell you how far from the mean is the value of a 75 in terms of standard deviations. How far from the mean is the value of an 80 from, from, uh, from 77.2 in terms of standard deviations? How far is 81, 60, and 90 from the mean in terms of standard deviations? So again, very clear and make sure that everyone understands this. Again, I don't want to leave anybody behind. Every single raw score, so here, this x value represents a raw score. That's what this represents, the score, okay, for each individual. Every single raw score in my data set is going to have an associated z value. So we're not going to have one z value for everyone because that's not useful to me. I want to know now how far each individual score is from the mean in terms of standard deviations. I don't want to know how far, on average, everyone's score is from the mean because I technically already know that. That's called standard deviation, right? But here, the z now is going to tell me precisely your distance from the mean in terms of standard deviations. So again, remember, each distribution has its own mean and own standard deviation. So we're going to have our own average and our own variability for every single distribution that we're working with. So let's say, for instance, this is our performance for exam number one. Well, what about exam number two? Well, on exam number two, we're going to have our own mean and our own standard deviation. And why are we going to have a different mean and a different standard deviation from exam one to exam two? Because they're going to represent different ideas or different constructs. Remember that this idea of a construct is this mental representation that we're working with that is abstract in its nature. Because remember, that was what our definition of a construct was. And then we applied our operational definitions to those constructs. So in other words, this distribution here represents the construct for exam number one, for instance. Then what about exam number two? Exam number two is going to look exactly the same because whenever it is that we standardize all our scores, when, it, when we do the standardization of all our scores, we have a normal distribution. That's a very important issue that we need to talk about here. Whenever it is that we're talking about a z-score distribution, we are always talking about a normal distribution. Okay, So it doesn't matter what the mean and standard deviation is for that distribution because it will always look like this Okay, whenever it is that we convert everything to being a standard score. So whenever it is that we do that standardization, it puts everyone on the same playing field as we have here. So this distribution becomes identical to each other. Okay, Now with that being said, this distribution here represents exam number one, this distribution here represents exam number two. Why do I say that different distributions reflect different constructs? Well, think of it in this fashion. What did we test in exam number one? So if this is exam one, what did we test in here? We talked about measures of central tendency, we talked about measures of variability, uh, introduction to statistics, frequency distributions. Those were our big chapters that we covered in that particular case. What about for exam number two? Is the same information being covered? And the answer is going to be no. Some of it may be similar, but not all of it's going to be identical. So in other words, for exam number two, we're going to cover such things as Z distributions. We're also going to talk about probability. We're also going to talk about introductions to hypothesis testing. So in our second distribution, it represents a different construct. So in reality, think of it like this. Let's say that you get an average for uh, the group for exam number one, and that is a value of a 77.2, right? That's what we had said, 77.2. Oops, there we go. And what about now for exam number two? There we go. Let's say that on exam number two, the average is now a 70.2. Is it fair for me to compare 77.2 to 70.2 and call them the same thing? And the answer should be no. Because even though this average represents exam number one and this represents exam number two and they're both technically exams, they represent very different things that we covered in exam number one versus exam number two. So you really can't compare apples to oranges, right? 
We really don't want to do that. But if we put everyone's score on a distribution that looks the same, such as here and here, so you'll notice that both distributions look identical. The only thing that changes here are the means. And we're going to talk about whenever it is that we actually change the means, what happens in that particular case. So here, if we actually have a distribution that looks like the following, whenever it is that we have a distribution for our standard score, our standard score distribution is going to look like the following here, normal, and the mean is going to be equal to zero. Why is the mean going to be equal to zero? Well, here, think about what a z-score distribution is going to look like. Remember, what do z-scores tell us? How far is your score from the mean in terms of standard deviations? So, if you think about it in this capacity, if this value here represents the mean, right? So that line there represents the mean. And you get a score that is equal to the mean, then technically you've deviated zero values from the mean, right? So think about that. So here we're talking about your own particular score. So if my distribution looks like the following here, right, just like I have here. So this is my Z distribution. So now what I want to do is I want to put everybody on the same playing field. Okay, so I want to put exam number one and exam number two on the same playing field. Looking at them here is not going to be fair. Looking at them here now is going to be fair. Why? Because now what I can do is I can say, okay, in exam number one, Susie got a 75 and she's below the mean. But in exam number two, Susie receives a grade of a 75. Here, we'll see if this comes out. There we go. Susie now gets an exam score of a 75 in both cases. In exam number one, she's performing worse than the, than the rest of the group. In exam number two, though, she's performing better than the group. Does everyone see that difference? So, for Susie, in exam number one, she gets a 75. The group's average is a 77. Here, she's performing worse than the group. Now, for exam number two, she gets a 75. And in exam number two, the class average is a 70.2. So here, technically, even though she gets the exact same score in both exams, in one case, she's doing worse. In one case, she's doing better than the average. Right? Now, why am I able to draw then that conclusion? Well, because now I'm going to put everybody on the same playing field on this distribution right here. That's what I want to try to do. So every distribution that we're going to be working with is going to be different. So potentially here for my distribution for exam number one, it may be looking normal. That's not always the case. So let's think of it like this. And here, let me just uh, delete this really quick. So let's say for exam number one, my distribution may look like the following. So this is the distribution for exam number one. So my average for exam number one was a value of a 77.2. My distribution now for exam number two may look something like the following. My average now is a 70. Um, what did we say? A 70.2 or something, right? Let's just say 70.2. So here for exam number one, this is what my distribution looks like. You'll notice now that this particular distribution is not normal, right? Because more than likely, like I told you, out in the real world, it's very unlikely that you're ever going to get something that looks like a real normal distribution. It's very unlikely that that's going to happen. So here, again, it's not fair for me to compare this group's performance to this group's performance because they're measuring different things. This is measuring exam number one. This is measuring exam number two. So it's measuring very, very different things. So what do I want to do now? I want to now put everybody on the same playing field with a standard score distribution, such as what we call the Z-score. We're now going to have 
always a normal distribution like I mentioned. We're going to have a normal distribution. Okay? The mean for that distribution is going to be equal to zero. Again, why is that mean going to be equal to zero? Because we're essentially now saying, okay, your score, if it is, a e if it is equal to the mean, you didn't deviate at all. Okay? So your score is equal to the mean. If that were to happen, then at that point, you are zero values away from the mean in terms of standard deviations. Okay? That's what we're talking about here in this particular point. So if your score is equal to the mean, you are zero points in terms of standard deviation, zero values away from the mean because your score is the mean. Okay, So here for Susie, again, remember, so the score for Susie, she gets a 75 on exam number one. Over here, for exam number two, she also gets a 75. But now you'll notice that even though she has the exact same scores for exam number one and exam number two, in exam number one, she's performing worse, right? So her scores are lower. And here, her scores are higher in comparison to the average, right? That's what we're trying to do here in this particular case. We're trying to now take apples and oranges and compare them all on the same playing field. That's the idea behind using a standard distribution or a standard score in our particular case. Okay, This is what we want to do. We want to put everybody on the same playing field. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to transform this distribution into that, and we're going to transform this distribution into that as well. How am I going to transform this distribution into that? I need to know the score. I need to know the average for that distribution and I also need to know the standard deviation. Okay. Now, whenever it is that I convert into this normal distribution, the conversion of this, this distribution to that or this distribution to this distribution here, I automatically know that it's going to be normal. Okay. I already know that automatically. This distribution here will convert into a normal distribution this distribution here will convert into a normal distribution here. Now in this particular distribution here that we have normal, remember a normal distribution has specific score percentages that need to be met. Remember the one, two, three standard deviations away from the mean, above and below the mean? So here, remember that we have, and let me just change the color of the pen, that we have a specific set of scores that are one standard deviation away and these are just my best drawing skills that I can two standard deviations away and last three standard deviations away so essentially here what we've done is we've done the following We've taken this distribution here that has a specific average and it has a specific standard deviation as well and we've converted it into this. Okay, The average for this z distribution, so this is my z distribution, is normal. The average is zero and then the yellow lines represent one standard deviation away the blue lines represent two standard deviations away and the green lines represent three standard deviations away. For this other distribution, for exam number one, when we convert it into standardized distribution just as we have here, it becomes exactly the same. So now what we're doing is now we can actually find out how well Susie did in exam number one versus exam number two. Okay? So here in exam number one, she got a 75. In exam number two, she got a 75 as well. So here it looks like she's not improving in any capacity. But if you actually look at the mean, Susie's performing worse in exam number one than she is in exam number two. Because in exam number one, she's below the group's average. In exam number two, she's above the group's average.
So here, that's the point of standard TV, DV, uh, sorry, of Z scores. Z scores are telling me how far every single score is from the mean in terms of standard deviations. And now what I can do is I can now identify in which group or in which exam, for instance, Susie is performing better at. So here, don't even think about exam number one and exam number two. Think of very, very different things. So here, for instance, let's think of the following situation. Oops. Let's think of a situation where you take a physics exam and a stats exam. Would you say that these two class exams are going to be comparable to each other? That they cover the same material, that they cover the same concepts, etc.? And your answer should be no, right? Whatever's covered in physics is going to be very different than what's covered in stats. There may be a little bit of overlap, but the majority of the content is probably going to be different. So if here, you, for instance, get a score of an 80 on the exam, and in stats, you get a 60 on the exam, technically, just by looking at your raw scores, in which class are you doing better? Are you doing better in physics, or are you doing better in stats? By looking solely at the raw scores, so solely by looking at those two values here, you should be saying, I'm doing better in physics, right? But what happens in the case where we find that the group's average in physics is a 95, and the group's average in statistics is a 42? Now, technically, in which class are you performing better in? In comparison now to everyone else. That's the key right there. So here, I'm not comparing your score to your score. I'm comparing your score to the group's performance. Okay, And that's the important part here of this whole idea of a z-score. I'm comparing your score to the group's performance. So I'm comparing your 80 to the 95, your 60 to the 42. So technically now, in which class are you performing better at? in comparison to everyone else? And your answer here should be statistics. Why? Well, because here in physics, even though you got an 80%, and 80 is greater than a 60%, in comparison to everyone else in physics, you're actually 15 points below everybody else. So you're not doing so hot. In stats, though, you have a 60, and the group's average is a 42. You're 18 points above. Now you're doing pretty good. So here, that's the whole point of a z-score. Now what now I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find out how far you are from the mean for your specific distribution, but now in terms of standard deviations. Okay, That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find out how far from the mean you are, but in terms of standard deviations. And it's a complicated way of saying your distance from the mean, but now in terms of how far on average your, our scores deviate from the mean. So it's kind of weird to say it like that, but essentially that's the point of a z-score. I want to know how far from the mean I am in terms of standard deviations. I know I've repeated myself a hundred times, but I'll be honest with you, conceptually, z-scores are probably one of the toughest stats to get. Mathematically, it's easy to understand because the formula is quite simple, but conceptually, it's quite difficult for us to actually capture in this particular instance. Okay, so going back to our lecture, essentially here, what I want to do now is I want to have a z-score, for instance, for the physics exam. I want to have a z-score for the stats exam. And now by having z-scores in both cases, I now have the same stat, right? So remember, I had the, the score for physics I had the score, oh, sorry, the score for stats, oops, but now I'm going to convert this score for physics into a z-score and this score for stats into a z-score, and now I'm going to be able to compare the two. What's this comparison going to tell me? It's going to tell me where I'm doing better in. Am I above the mean? Am I below the mean? What's going on here? Okay, so here, this had a very different distribution. So let's say, for instance, it had a distribution that was negatively skewed. And here, we had a distribution that was positively skewed. It's not fair for us to compare those two distributions. But now here, 
this distribution is normal in both cases so now I'm able to identify where I'm doing better in in terms of standard deviations okay that's the whole idea so what is a z-score going to tell me a z-score is going to specify the precise location of each individual x value within this distribution here of a z okay so again so it's going to specify the precise location of each x value so if you have five x values in your data set you need five z scores because each score each x value gets a z score each one of them because i want to know now every single every person's distance from the mean in terms of standard deviations individually that's what i want to know every single person individually so now we're actually giving back to this idea of individuality we took that away when we were talking about the group's performance but here now we're going back to the individual performance so now what I want to do is I want to find out well for physics the Z physics and then the Z stats for instance so here I'm further away from the mean for stats than I am for physics thus telling me where I'm performing better in. okay now what is it that we need to know about z-scores? Two very important things. Number one, we need to look at the sign of your z-score. Your z-score can have two signs, positive or negative. What does a positive z-score sign mean? It means that the value is above the mean. If you have a negative z-score, that means your value is below the mean. So if it's a positive z-value, you automatically know your raw score is above the mean. Okay, so I'll say that again. If we have a positive z-score, your raw score, okay, and what do I mean by your raw score? I mean your x value. So your score is above the mean. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Negative, your raw score, your x value again, below the mean okay that's the only thing that you need to know about the positives and the negatives positive and negative don't mean good or bad that's not what they mean at all they just mean where are you are you above or are you below the mean so again always remember positive means your score on the exam or on the assessment is above the mean negative your score was below the mean that's all you need to know about positive and negative. Okay, now let's look at the absolute value associated with your z-score. So ignoring the sign, okay? So ignore the sign completely. Let's look just at the value itself. Let's say, for instance, we have a z-value that is positive 2.40. Okay, what does that z-value mean? Number one, Look at the sign. That positive sign right there tells me what? Your answer should be your raw score is above the mean. Okay, that's what that positive sign means. Your raw score is above the mean. Okay, now what does 2.40 represent? 2.4 represents how far from the mean that one single value is from the mean. Okay, so how far from the mean your score is. Okay, that's very important. So in other words, your raw score is exactly 2.4. 2.4 what? Standard deviations. Because remember, it tells me in terms of standard deviations. So you're going to read this value as a standard deviation. So in other words, your raw score is exactly 2.4 standard deviations above the mean. How do I know that? Well, because I know that the value itself represents the distance from the mean in terms of standard deviations, right? So how far your score is from the mean in terms of standard deviations. And the positive sign tells me it's above the mean. I know this sounds really complicated and it almost sounds like, what? Like, why would I ever want to use this? You want to use this if you want to compare individuals who are doing different things, now comparing them on the same level. Okay, so again, 
your performance in physics versus your performance in statistics. So in physics, you have a score of an 80, but you're below the mean. So your z-score would be negative. In stats, your score is a 60, but you're above the mean. Your score would be a positive. Now, when is this going to come into play? When is the value going to come into play? We're going to calculate the value in just a couple of minutes here, and I'm going to show you how to do this, and we're going to work through a couple of examples. So here, you're going to have to be patient with me, and we're going to do this together. But once it is that we actually calculate the standard deviation for the distribution, we calculate the mean for the distribution, and we calculate the z-score for each individual value. So I need a z-score for physics. I need a z-score for stats because I need to compare them on this same distribution. Now, that value that I calculate is going to tell me again distance from the mean in terms of standard deviations. So how far my physics score is from the mean from its own distribution in terms of its standard deviation and how far my statistics score is from the mean of its distribution in terms of standard deviations. Because remember, this distribution here has its own mean and standard deviation. This distribution has its own mean and standard deviation. So thus, it's not fair for me to compare these means and these values on these separate distributions because they're not equal to each other. But here, they're equal to each other. But yet, this z value here is going to be calculated using the mean and standard deviation for the physics distribution. This z will be used, or will be calculated using the mean and standard deviation for the stats distribution. Okay? And I know it sounds weird and odd, and you're like, okay, I hate this. I'm going to pause the video. I never want to touch z scores again, and I quit. Don't quit. Keep with me, believe me, it'll get simpler as we're going through, as we work through examples, okay? So again, what does the value represent in terms of a z? Ignoring the sign, so again, look at the absolute value. So here, 2.40, ignore that it's positive or negative. 2.40 indicates, in our particular case, the magnitude distance from the mean in terms of standard deviations for that one particular score. The sign tells me if my raw score is above or below the mean. So here, how am I going to read a z equal to the positive 2.40? My raw score is exactly 2.40 standard deviations above the mean. That's what I'm going to interpret it as. Okay. So now let's go through a couple of more examples. So what is the mean for a distribution for z? Like I've mentioned before, our distribution for our sampling distribution associated with z is going to be equal to zero. Why is it going to be equal to zero? Because remember, a z value is going to tell me the distance from the mean that your raw, raw score is. So here, the distribution would actually then be equal to zero because it's assuming here that everyone's score is identical to each other and everyone's score, since they're identical to each other, should be equal to the mean. So in a normal distribution, our mean for this distribution is always right in the center. So this is the mean. Our mean for that distribution is always zero. Okay. Now, let's think about this idea uh, of null and alternative hypotheses. Uh, and I'm not sure if I've covered null and alternative hypotheses up to this point, uh, and I believe I have. Okay, and I was just looking back on my notes, and apparently I have not talked to you guys about normal uh, about the null and alternative hypothesis. So ignore the fact that I said think back. So here, don't think back yet because you have nothing to think back on. But now here, I'm going to introduce this. So rather than think back, I'm now going to introduce null and alternative hypotheses. So let's talk very briefly here about uh, null and alternative hypotheses. Okay, in, in statistics, there's this idea uh, that we work with um, that we call the null hypothesis. Okay, we call it the null hypothesis. Um, and we also have what's called the alternative hypothesis. Okay, there, these are two very, very important ideas that we work with in terms of how the population functions. Now, when we think about the population, think about how the real world works out there in the population. 
think about flipping a coin, for instance. If you have a coin in your pocket or in your purse or in your wallet or wherever it is that you may have a coin, uh, take out that coin. It doesn't matter what kind of coin it is. And here you'll notice that there's two options. We have heads and we have tails, right? We're going to talk much more about probabilities next week. But here, think about that idea that we're, we're working with heads and we're working with tails. So you flip the coin and it's supposed to land on one or the other. It's supposed to land either on heads or it's supposed to land on tails. Those are the two options. Now, granted, I understand that you may flip the coin and you may say, oh, well, it landed right on its, on its side, you know, just by chance. You're absolutely right. If that does happen, kick the coin away, never look at the coin again because that is a weird possessed coin and I never want to find it again because in my world, I'm only supposed to have two options, heads and tails, not some weird little factor of it landing right on its side, right? So here, in my ideal world, I want two options. I want heads or I want tails. In research, the same thing happens out there in the real world. There are two options. The two options that we find are the null and the alternative. What does the null predict? The null predicts no effect. Okay. Uh, here, uh, whenever it is that I use the term effect as I am here, always think of result. So in other words, no result. Now here, don't think I'm saying it didn't work. That's not what the null says. It doesn't say it does not work. It just says there's no effect. So here, another way of thinking about this is saying no difference. Oops, and that's not the way. There we go. So no difference. If we were looking at relationships, it would say no relationships, right? So it says no effect, no difference, no relationship. The alternative predicts the, the opposite of the null. That's why we called it the alternative, right? Again, creative day in the naming process in statistics. Alternative hypothesis, we say there is an effect. There is, there we go, an effect. There is a difference, right? A difference, there we go. And there is a relationship. Okay? So those are our possible results that may exist in the real world that we work in, right? So in the real world, what does the real world mean? The real world means the population. Okay? That's the real world. Okay, so again, think about the purpose of statistics. Statistics serve two purposes. One is to describe and one is to infer. When we describe statistics, we're talking about measures of central tendency, measures of variability, right? We're talking about descriptive statistics. And then the very first week of class, I introduced the term inferential statistics. And I said, we're inferring about the population. And that's correct. We are inferring about the population. What are we inferring about? We are inferring about the null and the alternative hypothesis. In other words, when I collect data in a research study and I come to a conclusion at the end of that research study, there's only two possible answers that I can have. If I'm comparing groups, I'm going to say there's no difference or there is a difference. Those are my only two options. If I'm looking at relationships, there's no relationship, there is a relationship. Those are the only possible outcomes that may exist, okay, out there in the real world. So in a research study, I do them in controlled settings in a lab. Here, whatever I find in the lab, I'm going to assume is going to be what's going to happen out in the real world. We're going to call that generalization or external validity, okay? Very important term here that I'm introducing to you. External validity. So external validity. What is external validity? How well my results apply to a real world setting. So here essentially what I'm saying is the following. If in a research study here in the lab I find that group 1 and group 2 differ, I'm going to assume that out there in the real world with the population Group 1 and group 2 are going to differ. Because remember, what's the relationship between statistics and population parameters? Statistics are point estimate representations of population parameters.
So in other words, whatever I find using my sample, a smaller subset of the population in my research study, I'm going to assume that whatever I find with them is what I'm going to find out in the real world in the population using everyone. And I'm going to draw conclusions about the null and the alternative. Either I'm going to conclude there's no effect, no difference, no relationship, or there is an effect, there is a difference, there is a relationship. So here, how does this work symbolically? So let's assume here that I'm comparing two groups. So group one and group two. Now you'll notice here that these two terms that I've put up for you, and here you should already identify these right away. These two terms here are my sample mean. Remember, the key there is sample. What comes from a stamp sample? What kind of statistic or sorry, what kind of values come from samples? Statistics, right? So here, the null and the alternative don't refer to the sample. They refer to the real world, to the population. I know this sounds very odd, and you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, I'm really confused about what you're talking about. What do you mean the population? Again, that's who I really care about. I care about everyone out there in the real world, the population. They're the real world. So out there in the real world, there's only two possible results that may exist, the null and the alternative. So in my research study, though, I know I can't get the population to come in and participate. Rather, I get the sample to come in and participate. So my sample group one and group two, are now going to be compared. So I calculate statistics for them. Now, what is the population parameter associated with my sample mean? What's my population mean symbol? My population mean symbol, remember, is mu. So mu one and mu two. So here, I'm assuming that this sample statistic, whatever I calculate it at, is going to have a population parameter associated with it. So this value here that I'm calculating for my sample is the point estimate for the population in both cases, right? So here, for instance, the null hypothesis predicts the following. Mu1 is equal to mu2 and the difference between those groups is going to be equal to zero. Okay? Why is it going to be equal to zero? Because it's essentially saying there's no difference between the groups. So in other words, the average for group one and the average for group two are going to be equal to each other. Okay? But now here, if you notice, I'm now writing correctly the symbolic notation. I'm using population parameters. I'm not using sample statistics. And why? Because remember, the null and the alternative refer to population parameters, not sample statistics. So here, we can write it another way also. Mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero. They both mean the exact same thing. So here, if you say mu1 is equal to mu2 is equal to zero, or mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero, they both mean the exact same thing, so uh, don't worry about that specific instance. So here, think back to this aspect of a zero, okay? It's a very, very important term, okay? And we're going to keep talking about it, uh, that pretty much for the rest of the semester. What's the alternative hypothesis predict? The alternative hypothesis predicts, like I say, the alternative of what the, the null hypothesis would predict. The null predicts no difference. The alternative predicts that there is a difference. So in other words, mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to 0. Or mu1 is not equal to mu2 which is not equal to zero, okay? So now here, if you'll take note, I know what the value should be here, right? I know what this value should be. The value should be equal to zero because the null is telling me that, that look, the groups don't differ. So if they don't differ, the difference between the groups should be equal to zero. 
Here, I don't know what my value is. I just know it's not equal to zero. So here, I'm working with an unknown. Here, I'm working with a known value. So if you remember back from uh, math, in math, we've never liked to work with unknowns. We always like to work with known values. So here for us, we like to work with this idea of we know what everybody's score should be or we know what differences should be. And we're going to come back to this issue. We're going to revisit this issue a hundred times before the semester is done, to be honest with you. You know, I'm going to... I'm going to beat it into your heads, unfortunately, to be honest with you, because it's the most important part about statistics. If you can get this, you learn stats, to be honest with you. And here, if you're still not very familiarized with it up to this point, I, re I recommend rewinding the lecture, reviewing this idea of the null and the alternative multiple times. Um, and if you still don't get it, it's okay for now, because it's more important in the subsequent chapters that we're going to talk about. But I want to introduce it here so that we at least get a general idea of what it is that we're talking about. Now, as we're continuing on through the semester, I'm going to continue to bring up this idea because it's the most important part about stats, and it's how stats really do work. And since it's going to tell us how stats work, once you understand how they work, you've understood all statistics, to be honest with you. Okay, so going back here to this idea of z, why would z then be equal to zero? Well, because the null hypothesis is going to assume that everyone's score is going to be equal to each other, right? So why would it assume that? Why would the null assume that everyone's score would be equal to each other? Think about that. Why would the null assume that everyone's score would be equal to each other? Think back to when we talked about sampling error and effect variance. So effect variance versus error variance. Remember when we talked about that? And I said in standard deviation, in an ideal world, standard deviation would be equal to zero. Why? Well, because then everyone's score would be equal to each other, and that would mean that everyone got affected the exact same way. The null hypothesis predicts for Z, your score, so your score here, minus the population average. And here, why am I now talking about the population average? I'm talking about the population average because remember, the null talks about the population, right? So I need to talk about the population average. So the null predicts that the difference between your score and the population average is going to be equal to zero. That's what it assumes. The alternative assumes that your score minus the population average is not equal to zero. Okay? So what does that mean for us? So why is that important? Well, it's essentially going to say the following. So think, think about this. So score number one minus the mean is going to be equal to zero. Score number two minus the mean is going to be equal to zero. Number three, four, five, six, seven, and so on and so forth. If we were to take the average of all of those zeros, so the difference between the score and the mean would be equal to zero according to the null. If we took all of those averages, sorry, all of those zeros and divided it by the number of times we had participants, so let's say for instance we have uh, five participants. So we have participant number one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. The null predicts that the difference between this score and the mean is equal to zero. Right? So we'll just do it like this really quickly. Try to do this as fast as I can, but my pin is not keeping up with me. There we go. There we go. So the null predicts that the difference between the score and the mean is going to be equal to zero in all of these instances. Zero divided by, in this particular case, five is going to be equal to zero. Whoops. So I'll do it over here. Zero divided by five is going to be equal to zero. 
in our particular case. So here it's going to assume that the mean, since everyone's score is going to be identical to each other, no one should deviate from the mean. So if everyone's score is the same, then it means that everyone has the same mean as well and the same score, right? So if everyone gets the same score, let's say everyone gets a 2, 2 divided by, or sorry, 10 divided by 5 would be equal to a 2. So our mean is equal to everyone's score, so thus the difference between them is going to be equal to 0. Because the null assumes that z would be equal to 0. So in other words, everyone's score in the data set should not deviate from the mean. So everyone's individual score in the data set should not deviate from the mean. That's the idea behind the null hypothesis and z. That's why when we look at the distribution for, let me go ahead and erase all that, there we go. When we look at the distribution for z, that's why my mean is equal to zero, because it's assuming here, hey, I'm assuming that everyone's score is going to be equal to the mean, thus I'm going to set the mean equal to zero, because the difference between everyone's score and the mean is going to be zero, right? So here, when we look at the sampling distribution, we're going to assume here that the mean is equal to zero. So if you pull anything away from what I just talked about, know that the mean for the z distribution is equal to zero, right? So if you're just like, okay, I'll come back to all this a little bit later, just know this, the mean for the z distribution is equal to zero because the z-score assumes that all the raw scores should be equal to the mean. So again, in other words, the null should be correct because that's the only known value I can work with. I don't know what the alternative value is. I can only work with the null value. So in other words, again, everyone's score should be equal to the mean in that particular case. So here, what am I going to try to do? I'm going to try now to find how far every single score in my distribution or in my data set is from the mean. The mean is going to be right here. Okay? So here, assume that this would be representative of the mean for your specific distribution. Okay, so now let's look at how we calculate the Z score. So let's now work on calculating z. So this is the formula for z, and like I mentioned to you, it looks very simple when you initially look at it because you're just like, wow, you know, there are three little parts to it. Uh, there's your score, uh, there's also your mean, and now we have something down here. Now this may seem very, very familiar to everyone. This is our standard deviation, and I know what you're thinking, oh, not standard deviation again, but unfortunately, yes. Here is standard deviation. Uh, now here, this is the formula for sample z-scores, okay? So in other words, if for instance on the homework assignment it's requesting that you find the z-scores for a sample, this is the formula that you're going to use. Now you're going to see another formula in your textbook that's going to look like the following. z is going to be equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. Now in this particular case, this is the formula for population z, okay? So the population z-score. So it's essentially the same formula. The only thing that differs here is that we're now using the population mean and we're also calculating sigma. Now do recall that when we're calculating standard deviation, this is our formula for standard deviation. So this, uh, the sum of our square deviations, there we go, divided by n minus 1, we're going to take the square root of that equation, but yet over here with sigma, the population standard deviation, because remember this refers to the population standard deviation, it is the sum of x minus mu Uh, parenthesis squared divided by capital N and we're going to take the square root of that equation. So here they look very very similar but the core difference between the two is that in the Z calculation for the sample 
we're going to be using n minus 1 to calculate standard deviation. And over here for population z scores, since we're dealing with sigma and we're going to be dealing with the population, we need to make sure that when we calculate standard deviation for the population, we're using capital N. I'm going to refer to the issue of the sample more than anything because, again, I keep thinking in terms of the practical world that I work in. The practical world is I work with samples. I don't work with populations. So here, if you ever do read a question that talks about the population, make sure that you use this particular formula and this particular uh, equation for uh, the calculation of standard deviation for the population. But here, for our purposes, I'm going to be talking about the sample. And the majority of the questions that I selected in the homework assignments refer to the sample z-scores. But do make sure that you do read them, because those were, are where the tricky parts of those questions are going to be. OK, so let's say, for instance, we have a score that you received that's a 75. And you have a mean of a 61.1 and a standard deviation equal to 3. Now here what I've done for you is I've already gone ahead and given you a standard deviation uh, in, both of these, uh, in both of these word problems here that we're working with and the means for both of these uh, situations. Now here what I want to know is I want to know the following information. How far away from the mean is the value of a 75? in terms of standard deviations. So how far is a 75 from 61.1 in terms of standard deviations? Okay. Now remember, what does standard deviation mean for us? It means, on average, scores as a whole for the group deviated about three values from a 61.1. So now you'll notice that your value of a 75 doesn't deviate about three values from 61.1. It seems to deviate more. So here, the purpose of a z-score, again, is to tell you exactly the distance from the mean that your raw score is in terms of standard deviations. So here, let's first try out this particular um, scenario, and then we're going to go with this particular scenario, and we're going to compare the two. Because you'll notice here that the only difference between both of these scenarios is that in one case, our standard deviation is equal to 3, and in another case, our standard deviation is equal to 12. So we're going to go in and punch in our formula. So in our formula, we have a score of a 75 minus 61.1. There we go, 61.1. And we're going to divide by 3 in our particular case. And here we're working with a sample. Okay. So if you're wondering, you know, okay, if I were to ever calculate the standard deviation for this particular uh, example, would I be using the population? or sample standard deviation. Here, we're just going to say that we're using the sample. And here, I've just made up this data too. So if you're wondering, where did I get these numbers from? This is just data that I've made up, So just so we can work through an example. So here, so go ahead and do your math. So 75 minus 61.1 should give you a numerator equal to 13.9. Divide that by standard deviation, which is going to be equal to a value of a 3. And that now should give us a value of 4.63. So in other words, and here, if you do also notice, it's a positive. So make sure to include your positive. So this is your z value. So there's your z value, positive 4.63. So what does this mean for me? If I'm doing an interpretation of this particular z value here that I've done, and remember, all I've done to calculate 4.63, I've taken my score, which is a value of a 75, subtracted my mean of 61.1 from it, and uh, I've divided that by 3. So 13.9 divided by 3 gives me a value of 4.63. I don't need to take the square root of anything. If you'll notice here, this is just my whole formula, so you're all done at this point. So now I have a positive 4.63. Now here, before I even began this, I already knew that my z value was going to be positive. How did I know that my z value was going to be positive in this particular case? The way I know that my z value was going to be positive is because my score is above the mean. So since my score is above the mean, I follow that logic about the positive and negative attributes associated with the z-score, knowing that a positive z-value is going to indicate that my raw score is above the mean. A negative z-value is going to be a, a raw score that is below the mean. So here, 
my score of a 75 is greater, it's above my mean of 61.1, so I already automatically know that my z value should be a positive. Now here, my z value is a positive 4.63. What does this mean? This means that your score of a 75 is exactly 4.63 standard deviations above the mean. Okay, I'll say that one more time. Your value of a 75 is exactly 4.63 standard deviations above the mean. So if you'll notice now, remember that this value here represents an average deviation. So in other words, we're saying on average scores deviate from the mean about three values. If you multiply 3 times 4.63, that gives you 13.89. So here, when you multiply this 4.63 standard deviations times your standard deviation value, that gives you the exact difference between 75 and 61.1. But here, even though I am kind of indicating that to you at this point, the most important thing here that we do recall is that here, our raw score is above the mean, and it is above the mean by exactly 4.63 standard deviations. That's how we're going to read this information here. and That's very, very important for me. So now, let's now look at the next example. Score is still a 75. My average is still a 61.1. And my standard deviation is now equal to a 12. So go ahead and do your calculations for Z. So I'm going to go ahead and let you do that. So 75 minus 61.1 gives you 13.9, but now we're going to divide that by 12. Because remember, my standard deviation is 12. So we're saying on average scores deviate from 61.1 about 12 points. So I've, I'm going to divide 13.9 divided by 12, gives me a new standard deviation of 1.16. And remember, it's still positive. So this is a positive 1.16. Okay, so what does this now mean? So if you'll notice, in both situations, my score doesn't change. My mean didn't change, but my standard deviation did change. So why is it that now my z-score is smaller than it was in the previous example? Well, remember, your z-score your is dividing by the standard deviation. So in one instance, it was dividing by 3. In another instance, it was dividing by 12. So in our second example, we're saying, hey, look, scores are more spread out within your data set. Okay? Within your group, scores are much more spread out than they were in the first example. Since there's a lot more dispersion, it's feasible here that scores are around the mean but by about 12 points because there's so much deviation. So since our standard deviation is a lot larger, and z-score is telling me the distance of my raw score from the mean in terms of number of standard deviations, here, now it's telling me, look, the deviation between 75 and 61.1 is 13.9. But now, the distance from the mean in terms of standard deviation, it goes from 4.63 to a 1.16. Why? Because there's a lot more dispersion. Because this number here is greater in the denominator. Since there's more dispersion in my second data set, giving me a larger standard deviation, it's going to make my score look like if it's a lot closer to the mean because the standard deviation is a lot larger in the second example. In the first example, it looks like if my score is really far away from the mean because it's so many standard deviations above the mean. It's 4.63 standard deviations above. So one of the things that you have to consider in terms of the z-score is that the z-score is very useful for us because the larger the value of a z-score, the further from the mean you are. So I'll say that again. So here I'm repeating myself, okay? So very, very important. The larger your z-score, the further from the mean you are, okay? The smaller the z-score, the closer to the mean you are based on the number of standard deviations. Okay, very, very important. Based on the number of standard deviations. 
So here, what do I want? It depends. What does it depend on? Well, let's say, for instance, I took an exam and I got a 75 on the exam, but I want to perform better than the group overall. Well, in that particular case, then, I want to have a very large z-score because I want to be way above the average, okay? I want to be far as away from the average as I possibly can above it, right? If I want to interpret it as I'm performing better than everybody else. So here, something like a 4.63 positive would indicate for me that, hey, you know what? I'm doing pretty well in comparison to the group. I'm above the mean in terms of my raw score, and I'm four standard deviations away. So I'm about 13 values away from the mean. That's good for me. I'm happy about that. In my second example now, if I'm only a z-score of 1.16 values away from the mean in terms of an exam performance, well, I'm really not that different from everybody else because there's a lot of dispersion and there are people who have a lot of higher grades, lower grades, etc. Thus, in terms of the amount of variability that there is within the group, there's a lot more variability, so I'm really not that far away from the mean. Even though I'm 13.9 values above the mean, in, re in terms of standard deviations, I'm really not that far from the mean. Okay, That's the way that we're going to interpret that information in that particular case. Okay, so what can a z-score do for us? So let's think of a practical application to z-score, right? Because that's the important thing here that we have to consider. What's the practical application of a z-score? Remember that the idea of a z-score is that it's going to allow us to make comparisons across different distributions or across different performance constructs. So what does that mean for us? Again, think, for instance, that you got a score on a psychology exam versus a score on a math exam. On the psychology exam, you scored a 60. On a math exam, you scored a 56. So to find out in which course you're doing better in comparison to everyone else, you need to know first the mean and standard deviation for both distributions. So in other words, in psychology, because remember, these are different people also in psych and math. So here in psych, there has to be an average and there has to be a standard deviation. For math, there has to be an average for that exam performance and there has to be a standard deviation. We're not going to use the same mean and standard deviation for both distributions, right? Because they're coming from different places. So here, it, it wouldn't be logical for me to think that the psych average would be the same as the math average and that the psych standard deviation for exam number one would be the same as the math standard deviation for exam number one because they're dealing with different people with different ideas. So here, Potentially, we're going to be working with different uh, means and different standard deviations in our particular case. So here, I want to know in what class I'm performing better in in comparison to everyone else. So that's the key, in comparison to everyone else in terms of the students. That's what I'm interested in. Who, where am I doing better in comparison to everybody else? So not necessarily in what class do I have a higher grade. I want to know in which class I have a better grade in comparison than everybody else. Okay, so I need to know my mean, I need to know my standard deviation. Okay, so here's my mean. Oh, I don't want to show you the answer yet. Okay, so here's my mean and my standard deviation for the psych exam, my mean and my standard deviation for my uh, math exam. So for psych and for math. Okay, number one, to calculate z, and again remember, my z formula is going to be equal to my score minus my group's average divided by standard deviation. Okay, so I'm already giving you that information here. So number one, let's calculate first the z-score for psych. So here, why am I saying that I'm going to calculate first the z-score for psych? I'm saying that because I am. There's only a z-score for psych, and then there has to be a separate z-score for math. I'm not going to calculate one z-score for both together. I have to calculate a z-score for each distribution separately. So in other words, there's a score here, it needs a z-score. There's a score here, it also needs a z-score. So I need a z-score there, and I need a z-score here. Okay? So let's calculate it first for my first, uh, for my first x value, right? So my x value is a 60, my mean is a 50, my standard deviation is a 10. Number one. Let's first begin with the sign. 
what's the sign of my z-value going to be equal to? Is it going to be positive or negative? Think about that. What does a positive z-value mean? A positive z-value means that your raw score was greater than the average. A negative z-score indicates that your raw score is below the mean. So here, my raw score of a 60, is that above or below the mean? The answer should be, it's above the mean. So I know that my z-value should be a positive automatically because my z-value is above the mean. Okay. So now, we're going to take our value of a 60 and we're going to divide uh, 60 minus 50 should give me a value of a 10, right? So 60 minus 50, divide that by 10. So here, my standard deviation is equal to a 10. My score is a 60. My average is a 50. So that will be 10 divided by 10. And that will give me a Z value equal to a 1. Okay? So for psych, Whoops. So for psych, my z value is equal to a positive 1. Okay? Now, let's look at math. In math, I got a 56. The average for math was a 48, and the standard deviation is a 4. So here in math, again, think about the positive or the negative. So what's my z-score going to be, positive or negative here? Again, the answer should be positive because my raw score is above the mean. So my raw score is greater than my mean for math. So here, automatically I know it's a positive value. So here, 56 minus 48. So again, we're using the same formula here. So 56 minus 48. Divide that now by 4. And here, why am I now using different means and standard deviations? Because remember, this mean and standard deviation only reflected for psych. This mean and this standard deviation reflects only for math. So if I'm trying to compare my math score to the group's performance for math, I need to know the group's performance for math and their standard deviation, not the psych uh, mean and standard deviation. I don't need to know that. So 56 minus 48 gives me a value of an 8, divide that by 4, gives me a value of a 2. So I know now that my z-score for math is equal to a value of a 2, positive 2. Okay, so now in which class are you doing better in in comparison to everyone else? That's what the z-score is going to answer for me. So in which of the two exams am I performing better in? So even though I got a 60 on the psych exam and on the math exam I got a 56, in which of the two classes am I doing better in? If you just look at the raw scores, you would say, well, technically you're doing better in psych because it's a 60, it's a higher grade than a 56. And you're right if you're looking at the raw scores. But here, I'm not interested in comparing the raw scores from psych to math. I'm interested in comparing how well I'm doing in comparison to everyone else for these particular groups. So in our particular case, for psych, I have a z-score of a 1. For math, I have a z-score of a 2. So technically, I am doing better in math because I am further away from the math average above the mean than I am in psych. So even though I have a higher grade in psych, I'm actually doing worse in psychology because I'm not that farther away from the mean in psychology than I am in math. In math, I'm two standard deviations away, so I am eight points above the mean, while over here, um, in psychology, I'm only 10 points above the mean, but my standard deviation is what's pulling me down. So in other words, people are getting higher grades than just a 70. People are getting 70s, or sorry, higher grade than just a 50. Maybe people are getting a 70, an 80, a 90. 
thus pulling standard deviation up. Over here, people are very close to performing at a 48. Even though I'm also at a 56, very close to a 48, I'm technically further away and doing better in math than I am in psychology according to my standard deviations. Okay. Now let's assume here that this standard deviation was lower, that this standard deviation was a value of a 5. Okay. So in this particular case, if this value was a 5, and we were to redo our formula, uh, our equation here, and we divide 10 divided by 5, that gives me a value of a 2. Technically, in both classes, I'm performing identical. Why? Well, because I have the exact same distance from the mean in terms of standard deviations. So in both classes, I would technically be doing as well. But in this particular case, even though I have a lower raw score in math, I'm technically doing better because I'm further away from the mean than I am in psychology. Okay. Hopefully that makes some intuitive sense. Now, let's go back here to our graph because I do want to show you the, the, the graph very quickly here. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of this graph here that I had shown you? So for psychology, this is where I was. Okay, I'm right here at the one point. Okay, so I'm one standard deviation above the mean because remember, the mean would be equal to zero. In math, I am two standard deviations above the mean. So here now you'll notice I'm putting math and psych on the same distribution. Is this fair? The answer is yes, because I've converted my psych score of a 60 and my math score of a 56 into Z scores, so Z equaling positive 1, and Z equaling positive 2, there we go, I've converted both of them into Z's, so now that makes them equivalent. So here, we were talking about psych score, math score, but now we're talking about Z and Z, so we can put them both on the same distribution in this particular case. So here, in which class am I technically doing better in? I'm doing better in math because I'm further away from the zero value. Now, here let's assume, and going back to our um, example here that we had, let's say that in psychology, my score wasn't a 60, my score was a 50. Okay? Calculate my Z score for a psychology score equaling to a 50. So calculate Z for psych equaling 50. So psych equaling 50, calculate my z-score. So again, take my score, 50, minus my average, 50, and we're going to divide by 10. Okay. So 50 minus 50 will be equal to 0. 0 divided by 10 is going to be equal to 0. Okay. What's my point of showing you this? My point of showing you this is that if this were the case, where your z-score is equal to zero, what does that mean? If your z-score is equal to zero, that means that your score was the mean. That's what that refers to. If a z-score is equal to zero, that refers to your score being equal to the mean. So in this case, the difference between your score and the mean was equal to zero. The zero divided by any standard deviation is going to be equal to zero in this particular case. So here, you technically didn't deviate from the mean. You're exactly at the mean. So here, if we go back to our graph one more time, and we plot out our scores, <clears throat> if your score is at a 50 and the average was a 50, then you're right at the mean. When your score was a 60 and the average was a 50, you're at one standard deviation. When your score was a 56 and the average was a 48, you're two standard deviations above the mean because of the standard deviation being equal to 4 in that particular case. So remember, if z equals 0, your score is the mean. Okay? You got the average. Okay? You got exactly the average score. If z is a positive, 
your raw score is above the mean. If your z-score is negative, your raw score is below the mean in that particular case. Okay, so one last thing that I want to talk to you about. What happens in the case where I don't know what my x value represents? So in the case where we don't know what our raw value is in our data set, because in some instances we may be asked, okay, we know what the z-score is, we know what the mean is for, for this distribution, and we also know what the standard devia deviation is for this distribution, but how do I find my x value? If the score is unknown, but yet you have your z value, you have your standard deviation, and you also know your average, you can easily calculate your raw score. So let's take this example in this particular case. If my z-score is 0.5, my standard deviation is a value of a 5, and my mean is a 50, I should now be able to calculate what my score is. So 0.5 times 5 is going to equal 2.5 plus 50 in our particular case. Oh, and, oh sorry, you know what? I completely forgot that negative 0.5, so I do apologize for that. So 0.5 negative times 5 is a negative 2.5 plus 50 so 2.5 negative plus 50 gives me a raw value equal to 47.5 now here I should have known right from the start that my raw score was less than a 50 how do I know that because of the negative sign in my z value. So here, since I knew that that was negative, I should have automatically known that my raw score was below a 50. That's why when I initially said, oh, sorry, my mistake, I forgot to put in the negative, I was thinking about that and I was like, well, uh, I was like, my score, I was like, is it above or below the mean? Well, wait, how do I know that? And I went back and saw the negative and I said, well, then I know that my uh, value should be below the mean because my z value was a negative. So here my score is below the mean in this particular case. So thus being confirmed by the negative sign in my z value here. Okay. Now you may also see the formula uh, to find uh, your score as the following. So z um, multiplied by sigma plus mu means the exact same thing as this. It's just using population parameters. So this is for the population. And again, like I mentioned, I like talking about the sample. So that's why I present here for you the sample, but the population is exactly the same. So let's say, for instance, um, a z-score is given to you that's equal to a value of a 4. Sigma is equal to a value of a 2. And mu is equal to a value of a 15 and you want to know what your score is again follow the exact same formula so here uh, do take note that I have a positive 4 as my z-score so I automatically should know that my raw score should be where above or below the mean the answer should be above the mean because I have a z-score that is a positive so that automatically tells me that my raw score should be above the mean so 4 times 2 is going to give me a value of an 8 plus my value of a 15 gives me an x score equal to a 23. So in other words, my score of a 23 is what's given to me here. And if you wanted to ever just confirm your math, you can then do the formula for, um, for z. So remember that your formula for z is score minus the, the mean divided by standard deviation. So here, 23 minus 15, divide that by 2. So 23 minus 15 gives me a value of an 8. Divide that by 2, gives me a value equal to a value of a 4 positive, and that's my z value there. 
that's given to me in our particular case. And here, in this particular case also, 47.5 minus 50 divided by 5. And again here, if you do your math, 47.5 minus 50 gives me negative 2.5, divide that by 5, and that gives me a z value equal to negative 0.5. Okay, so here I've just confirmed my math that I've done this correctly here to get that particular uh, answer there. If you ever redo your math and you don't get the z value that's given to you there, something went wrong in terms of your calculation of your score. So here, again, it's easy for us to be able to find our score. We just have to do reverse order of operations that we normally have been accustomed to doing, or, rever or reverse math in this particular case, um, to find our, our value. And again, uh, on an exam, I'll always give you the formula uh, for being able to find that. It's much more important for me for you to know how to apply the formula correctly rather than saying to yourself, okay, I need to memorize the formula. Because out there in the real world, very rarely, if ever, will anybody say, how do you calculate the formula? Okay, so I have put uh, a practice assignment here for you all online. Um, and I do want you to work through this uh, practice assignment for yourselves. Uh, I'll be posting up the response to this assignment um, by Wednesday of this week, just so that, that way you're able to look at what the answer should have been. And hopefully everyone should have gotten uh, a Z value for every single um one of uh, our uh, our examples. Now here, I would like for you just to only do steps one and two. Don't worry about step three at this point. Okay, don't worry about that. So again, very important, find each z-score. So in other words, there's a z-score for 12, 15, 11, etc, etc, etc. So again, every single x value gets a z-value. Okay, very important. So go ahead and try those out and uh, I'll present the the, uh, the work through for this particular assignment uh, on Wednesday. Now before I end my lecture, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, number one, uh, make sure to finish uh, your homework assignment uh, by Friday by 11.59 p.m. It is due this Friday by 11.59 p.m. Uh, also make sure to complete your initial discussion board post by Friday by 11.59 p.m. and then also your reply to someone else's uh, post by no later than Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Uh, please make sure to also review the book chapter because the book chapter is very important for you to be able to uh, follow along with this information. Hopefully the lecture has kind of put z-scores into perspective for you when they're used, what they mean, how to interpret it, and how to calculate. I do understand that it is a little bit of a confusing topic to discuss, uh, but if you do have any questions or concerns, please do let me know and I'll be happy um, to talk to you about uh, your specific issues that you may have. Um, also, um, I know that this seems like a very intimidating chapter. It's really not. It's once you get a good grasp of understanding how to calculate standard DV, or sorry, how to calculate z-scores, that z-scores become very user-friendly for us and very valuable also. Have a good rest of your week, uh, and I will talk to you all soon.